Welcome to the Brain People Podcast, a show where four mental health experts team up to bring you practical tools for overcoming mental health challenges. The Brain People don't replace your doctor or therapist, but we will give you some extra tools to help you on your journey. So join us as we fight mental illness, one episode at a time. Welcome to the Brain People Podcast. My name is Dr. Katie Elson. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and joining me is... Dr. Daniel Binus. Yes, and we are today talking about the root causes of mental illness. Now, specifically because in the month of May, do you know what's happening in the month of May? Other mm. than my birthday? <laughs> should, I, <laughs> should I be aware of something? <laughs> yes, mental health awareness, right? This is a time where we want to highlight mental illness and talk about it because there's been so much stigma over many, many years and um, a lot of misconceptions about mental, mental illness. And right, we just want to take some time to talk more about mental illness and the root causes. Yeah, I think it's such an important and overlooked topic. And so I'm really excited about our show today. And I hope our listeners take a lot of practical tips away with them. Yeah, so let's just start with why why is it important to talk about root causes? Well, that's a great question. You know, when I was a resident in psychiatry, I, I have to be honest and say that I got a little frustrated with seeing the way that psychiatry was generally done. Now, I, granted, I was trained at Loma Linda, and so I think I actually got a really positive experience mm -hmm. because there was also the integration of spirituality and, and a, really a more holistic mindset. But I still saw in general how psychiatrists are trained and kind of almost like pushed into a box that really says, okay, depending on the symptoms, you just have to figure out the right medication and then you send their, the person on their way and hope that they do better. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and I said, okay, yeah, I can see how medications can be important. But the frustration piece was that I saw a lot of people over years being on medications and often coming back and struggling with the same issues and not getting better. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, how are we really addressing mental health problems here? Are we really helping people or um, healing people or are we just covering up symptoms? Mm -hmm. Symptom management, as yeah. we often talk about it, yeah. Exactly, and and maybe some of our listeners have heard the, the expression of pill for every ill, and, and you know, that was kind of, it, it started to really bother me. Well, I started to do some research, and then um, actually around that time, I also got introduced to Dr. Neil Nedley, who had a really interesting approach when it came to mental health where he was actually looking at root causes. And as I was listening to him and looking at some of his work, I started to realize like, wow, there's some really good things here that he's he, he's thinking about and teaching and helping people with. And so I, I, I really started to adopt some of his uh, treatment and intervention paradigms, and I've seen really amazing results. So we're going to talk about those today, right? Yes. Um, but before we do, an example that came to mind is, you know, when I was little, my mom would tell us to go pick out the weeds. And I'd go and my siblings and I thought we were really sneaky and we'd go and we'd get scissors. And we just chopped them right up, right? Just the top of it. And from the surface, it looked great, right? I got all the weeds in fast record time. Oh, wow. But Your my mom must have thought you were the most amazing weed puller ever. No, she knew, uh -oh. right? Shortly after, they'd grow back, right? Because the root causes of the weeds were not addressed. Absolutely. And I think that's often what we see, whether even in therapy or with medication management, a lot of times it's they look better but are we really addressing the root causes? Absolutely. And I think that's a great analogy. And another analogy that I really like too is, you know, let's say that someone had swollen legs and they went to the doctor and they said, doctor, you know, my legs are swollen. It's really bothering me. Um, people don't like the way my legs look. <laughs> I don't like the way my legs look. And so the doctor's like, uh-huh, yes, I see. Okay, I'm going to diagnose you with swollen leg syndrome and I'm going to give you a diuretic medication and send you on your way. Now, that diuretic medication might actually take the swelling away. Mm. But what is the problem with that situation? Well, if that individual 
had heart disease, for example, and that was part of what was causing the swollen legs, then that could, and, and then you just treated it with medication, but you didn't take the time to really address and investigate like what is the underlying cause, mm -hmm. then the disease process could continue. And sure, symptoms might be a little better for a while, but eventually that person could get very ill with heart failure if they didn't make some changes uh, or maybe even die, you know, from heart, heart failure. And so, but we do that all the time mm -hmm. in psychiatry with medications. We're like, okay, you know what? These are the symptoms. Let me just give a medication without really spending enough time. I mean, I'm not saying that um, all psychiatrists or all psychiatry <laughs> It doesn't take any time to look at, at some of the causes, but I think we need to go deeper mm -hmm. to really look like what are as many of the causes that are triggering the symptoms as possible so we can address those so that we can get better and stay better. Mm -hmm. And I would say not just for psychiatry, but even in counseling, sometimes it could be easy to say, okay, here's a skill, right? And then they're on their way because what you're highlighting is the need for time, right? Mm. Both with the weeds, the weeds you need to dig deeper but both with also your analogy of you need to take time to investigate. Yes. Now, I think that's a, a great point because even with counseling, you can have a skill, teach a skill. Someone can manage their emotions better, but have they really resolved some of the underlying trauma or maybe the bitterness and pain that is there? Maybe they need to go through forgiveness, you know, and maybe they need to actually face those fears head on and realize that they don't have to be afraid of those things anymore or whatever it might be. So I yeah. think you're actually right on. Mm -hmm. So mental illness is a very complex problem. It is. Right? Yeah. Um, so we're going to be talking about the different causes so that we can understand better than how to treat mental illness. Absolutely. So, you know, as, as Dr. Nedley was uh, researching through this and he was looking um, at mental illness and the causes for that, he actually found over 100 causes. Wow. So I hope our listeners are, are ready for, you know, being here for a couple of hours as we go through. I'm not ready. <laughs> oh, Dr. Katie's not. Okay. So maybe we'll try to shorten it a little bit. But the good news is that uh, he was able to actually lump those over 100 causes into 10 broad categories. And so those categories we call hits. And what we find is if we can figure out what hits somebody has, and address those, then that really helps them uh, treat their mental illness and really get better. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing that we found, so there's 10 broad um, categories or hits that most people need at least three or four of those hits to actually push you over the edge mm -hmm. into a mental health problem. Uh, you know, we're pretty resilient. So usually we can mm -hmm. kind of sustain and hang in there if we've had maybe two and maybe sometimes even three. Uh, but usually once we get into that four or five number of hits, then it's like, okay, that pushed me over the edge. I don't have the capacity to be resilient anymore. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I think, and mentioning it before we cover the hits, because a lot of people might be listening and they hear number one and they're like, okay, do I have a mental illness? Right. Or right. number two, but really it's a combination of different factors that increases your risk to developing a mental illness. Exactly, yes. And so it, it is always a combination of factors. And again, what we want to do is we kind of want to be sleuths, you know, we, we want to figure out like, what are the different factors so we can address those and get better. Yeah. So let's jump right in because we All have right. 10 major categories yes. to go through. Let's start with the first one, which probably many of our listeners can actually guess. It's one that we often talk about. That's right. So genetics is a very common thing that has been researched in mental health. Almost, I, would, I wouldn't say ad nauseum, but almost at the at the expense of maybe looking at research in, in other areas. But certainly we do know that there is a inheritable component uh, for mental illness. And um, but again, it's not 100 percent. So there have to be other factors uh, that are that are present as well. I think about the example of schizophrenia. You know, mm -hmm. schizophrenia we know has a strong genetic component, but even with schizophrenia, if you look at twin studies, in other words, you look at identical twins who have the same DNA, the same genes, right? Mm -hmm. But even with identical twins, if there's one twin 
that has schizophrenia, only 50% of the mm -hmm. other identical twins have schizophrenia. So obviously we know even with schizophrenia, which again is a strongly inherited uh, trait, one of the, probably the most genetic um, uh, mental illness that we have, um, it's only 50%. And so there's other factors that play a role. Yeah. And then you can think about the studies then that have them in different environments, right? That's and right. And then impact of environment. So number two has to do with what? Well, that has to do with development. And when we talk about the developmental hit, really what we're talking about is the things that happen as our brain and our life is developing. So the, the childhood, really. Mm -hmm. So that can be uh, any kind of significant stressor or trauma in childhood. So that could include any kind of abuse, whether it was emotional abuse, sexual abuse, or physical abuse. But it could also you have to do with something that might be not quite as apparent, like mm -hmm. neglect, for example. Mm -hmm. Or uh, oftentimes when parents go through a divorce, that can be stressful enough to also be a, a triggering point uh, for, for young people and set the stage. Or when there's violence in the home, maybe that child is not itself being abused, but mm -hmm. they're watching maybe their mother being emotionally abused, or maybe their parents have a, a drug addiction, mm -hmm. um, or perhaps there's... Um, a parent who is in trouble with the law and they're having to go to prison or they're absent all the time and it's causing chaos in the home. So anything that's significantly stressful in childhood is also a hit. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, when they say like type A or type B trauma, type A, when we think about it, it's like, oh, bad things happening, but mm -hmm. also another type of trauma is the absence of good, right? Yes. So the neglect of our emotional needs being met or even physical needs or other things as well. So it's a critical time for kids to be developing. And if there are things that are happening that are um, that get in the way of that development, it can really impact someone's mental health. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing I want to go back real quick on the, the genetics, because people might wonder, like, well, how do I know if I have a genetic hit? Mm -hmm. So a first degree degree relative, if they have a, a significant mental health problem, then likely you also have carry, at least carry a gene. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the combination of those two, I've had many clients who maybe their mom has depression and then it's not only a genetic potential hit, but then also being raised by a mother or somebody who has a mental illness That's and a good the point. environment itself changes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so those two things often co-occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, and then the third thing is actually uh, has to do with stress and so complex stress because we all have stress right but we're talking about complex stress or ber bereavement uh, where someone has real significant stress going on in their lives and i will say oftentimes uh, these first three that we're talking about are the ones that are focused on in mental health and there's nothing wrong with that that you know we need to look at these things but a lot of times we miss out on the other seven that we're going to talk about here shortly but stress is an important factor and uh, and oftentimes what what happens is that um we look at the stressor that maybe pushes somebody over the edge but we don't we ignore maybe the other three or four things that also are present too. So we need to look at everything. But when we think about stress, of course, it can be the death of a loved one. It can be maybe a marriage breakup, um, maybe a um, even something. Well, and, and here's the interesting thing. It's not just negative things. Sometimes it can actually even be positive things. Like for example, if somebody has a child like it's happy time, mm -hmm. but it can also be a very stressful time because now suddenly you have the demands of being a parent, maybe mm -hmm. getting up in the middle of the night. So there's all these factors that start playing a role and there's additional stress or even getting married. And some people have a hard time adjusting to that. And again, that can be normal, mm -hmm. um, but it, it can sometimes push people over the edge. Mm -hmm. And many of us could probably think, oh, I definitely have this third one with the COVID pandemic. Right? Yes. And not just, you know, a temporary pandemic, but it's been going on for a long time. So we really have that com complex stress for all of us during this time. Yeah. Yeah. The ongoing. And that's often what makes it mo the most difficult. It's not just like, of course, if something is hugely stressful and traumatic, that's one thing and can be very harmful. But oftentimes it's the chronic ongoing stressors mm -hmm. that just wear on people and make it more difficult. Right. So we have genetics. We have 
development. And then we have this complex stress, bereavement. What's our number four hit? All right. So number four is addiction. So addiction is very prevalent uh, throughout the country and around the world. And uh, anything that is addicting, and that could include, of course, alcohol, drugs, nicotine, et cetera. Um, but it also can include behavioral addictions mm -hmm. as well. Uh, all of those things can predispose us to mental illness. Okay. Do we want to say anything else about that or do you want to jump to number five? I better, I think we better keep going. Okay, Otherwise we're okay. going to be here for way too long. <laughs> okay. What's the fifth hit? All right. So the fifth hit is toxins. So when we're talking about toxins, um, you know, the classic uh, one that we might think about is actually mercury poisoning. So mm -hmm. mad hatters uh, syndrome. So uh, oftentimes uh, when the the hatters, the people that were making the hats back in the day, they would use mercury to help mold the, I think it was felt. And, and so uh, through that, they would be exposed to the mercury and they didn't realize it was toxic and the mercury would get into their system and it would actually start making them crazy. Mm -hmm. And because their brain started being fried by the mercury. Mm -hmm. And so mercury obviously can be a big deal. Uh, most, most of us aren't expo overly exposed to mercury. Although that can still happen, especially if we talk about being exposed to too much fish, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and, the, and the mercury levels in, in the ocean, even in the ocean, like wild caught fish, uh, some studies have, have shown recently that it can be dangerous, especially if you mm -hmm. eat it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so, and so there's, and, but mercury is not the only toxin. I mean, there can be things like uh, arsenic, lead. Uh, there can also be uh, orga organophosphates, uh, you know, like pesticides, herbicides, Roundup, um, that sort of thing. So we have to be uh, careful. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about pesticides, we're thinking about, okay, what's in the food I eat, mm -hmm. what's in the air I breathe, and the water I drink. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the majority of our toxins are going to come from. So we want to be careful to mitigate and minimize our, our exposure. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about things that are a little bit more in our control, right? So maybe right. the first couple, especially in childhood or genetics, we have less control over or really no control over. Right. But we're starting to get into more hits that maybe there are things that we can change. Exactly. Yes. And to me, that's an exciting part of this whole mm -hmm. exercise, if you will, of going through these 10 hits, because we can start seeing like, wow, there are things I can do mm -hmm. to actually improve things and to make changes. Okay. So we have, that was our number five yes. hit, right? What's number six? <laughs> All right. So number six is nutrition. And this is a hot topic. And, you know, it seems like everyone has their opinion about nutrition. But uh, the bottom line is we want to really make healthy whole food choices. And, you know, we'll talk a little more later about what that looks like, but it, if we have the wrong kind of diet, see in other countries, sometimes it's, um, undernourishment, right? Mm -hmm. In America, we don't generally have that problem. We're often overnourished. In other words, we're getting too many calories, mm -hmm. but we often get the wrong calories. So we're actually malnourished. Yeah. And so it's not just about like making sure we have enough food on the table. Oftentimes we have too many calories. And I think part of why people often overeat is because they're not actually getting mm -hmm. the trace minerals and nutrients that you need. And so then your body craves like mm -hmm. more food, but really it's craving more nutrients. And so you keep eating, but it's not really being satisfied. Yeah. And so that's another one that's in our control. That's right. right? Yeah. 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 And so, and then number seven is lifestyle. And when we talk about lifestyle, what are we talking about there? Were we talking about having a lack of a regular exercise program? Because as human beings, we're made to move. And mm -hmm. if we're not moving, that actually does affect our brain's ability to function properly, our body's mm -hmm. ability to function properly. And another component of that is making sure that we're getting well hydrated. So mm -hmm. drinking plenty of water and we're getting outside. We're getting some fresh air, some sunshine. So those are lifestyle factors that are very important. And there's just a side comment here. Um, one thing that I realized we don't think about often with lifestyle is even just our posture. That's a good our point. Our posture and our breathing. Because we think, oh, fresh air, you know, I'm going outside. But even if we are sitting, 
how do we have good posture in order to really have that deep breaths that That's can help us? That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm going to set up more. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. <laughs> good, good reminder. Yes. So that was number seven. And number eight is circadian rhythm. So when we think about circadian rhythm, we're thinking about insomnia. In other words, we're talking about the right times to sleep, uh, the right times to eat, and uh, making sure that we're sleeping well through the night. So, you know, circadian rhythm has to do with our bodies, our whole body's rhythm. Mm -hmm. And if we get out of sync with the way we were naturally made to to live with our body clock and it's not in sync with uh, daylight hours and nighttime hours, that can actually throw off our biochemistry in our brain, our hor hormones start to get kind of whacked out and we just feel off. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because they've done studies that show even when people sleep enough hours, if they're sleeping at the wrong times, uh, for example, shift workers, people that are working at night, but they're sleeping during the day, that that throws them off and it actually predisposes them to, you know, more chronic, it's, it's more stressful on their bodies and it actually predisposes them to for mental, more mental health problems. Yeah, this is one that I definitely see whenever I'm doing an intake. Um, if they have sleep issues, it really contributes to more intense and severe mental illness symptoms. Yeah, it's huge. And I like the name of this one too, because it's like, yeah, we think mainly, mostly about the sleep. And I think that's the primary and most important element, but even our body really likes regularity. And so even with like the times of day that we eat, it's mm -hmm. actually really helpful to allow our, our body to get used to that. And it, it just mm -hmm. functions better. Mm -hmm. All right. And the All right. last number, one? Well, no, number, second to last. The second to last, yes. yes. So number nine is medical. So any kind of chronic medical condition can also predispose to mental health problems. So we can think about things like diabetes, heart disease, uh, epilepsy, um, traumatic brain injuries, uh, autoimmune diseases. So basically anything that is ongoing pain mm -hmm. is another big one. A lot mm -hmm. of people are affected by chronic pain and that can really predispose to mental health issues. Yeah, and if you think about a lot of the symptoms as well, um, I can think about depression with the tiredness or the fatigue and some of the more physical symptoms that could often overlap or be confused for a physical health condition. Absolutely, yeah, there is often overlap and it's kind of interesting because they've done studies that show that with depression, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes they can identify certain inflammatory markers that are actually elevated with a depression. And a lot, of, a lot of times they also identify similar elevated inflammatory markers uh, when people are actually uh, dealing with physical health issues as well, whether you know it's pain or whatever it might be. Okay. And then number 10, which right. is one of... Yeah. I think both of our favorites. <laughs> right. Yes. So the last one, last category is frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, I know we're going to do a, an episode one of these days on the frontal lobe mm -hmm. and get more detailed. But the reason I really like this category, because when you really understand the way the frontal lobe works and how to take care of the frontal lobe, then it almost like addresses all of the other mm -hmm. 10 hit or other nine hits and takes care of like mm -hmm. the whole issue. And the reason for that, the frontal lobe is really the part of the brain. that's the highest, the most complex part of our, mm -hmm. our bodies, actually. The CEO of our yes, brain. Yes, the CEO of our brain. And so it's the part of our brain that helps us be able to think clearly, make decisions, have self-control. It actually helps to manage our emotions so that our emotions don't get the best of it. Uh, so it helps us to have self-awareness. And so all these things are critical for good, not only good emotional management, but good relationship management and, and overall um, life skills. And so there's a lot of things that we found that cause frontal lobe dysfunction, including some of those other things we've already talked about. But to get a little more specific with a few things that we haven't talked about, uh, Things like entertainment media, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I never tell people you have to do completely. You can never watch another movie again. You can <laughs> never watch TV again, but you have to be extremely careful mm -hmm. with what you expose yourself to and how long, mm -hmm. because that will actually shut down your frontal lobe 
it will make it so your frontal lobe doesn't work as as well and that creates an imbalance in the brain so when we do things like again too much entertainment media too many video games going against um, our conscience and feeling chronically guilty um, any of those ad- addictions that we were previously talking about uh, that we might not always think about as addictions like pornography or gambling or even <laughs> caffeine addiction so these sorts of things can actually impair the frontal lobe and another thing that we don't always think about is actually unforgiveness mm-hmm. you know unforgiveness it creates a lot of yeah a lot of negative emotion Mm -hmm. and that negative emotion can really it it, it basically interrupts the ability of the frontal lobe to think clearly and it kind of is a similar idea with with guilt like chronic Mm -hmm. guilt too like and and that's why i said going against our conscience can also Mm -hmm. impair the frontal lobe because if we're having you know these intrusive thoughts about things we did bad or anger about how someone else treated Mm -hmm. us and this bitterness that's going to make it hard for us to stay concentrated Mm -hmm. and to actually stay engaged with our frontal lobe because we're we're constantly being interrupted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you kind of described with the frontal lobe um, hit is a lot of people's lifestyles today. Yeah. The media, the addictions, unforgiveness or anger and bitterness. So just that hit alone, we could really talk about in depth of the things that we can do. But I know for the sake of time, you know, just in general, what are some things that we can do to address some of these 10 hits? Yeah, the good news is that you can do something about all of these. Mm -hmm. And I know at first glance, people might think, well, okay, most of them maybe you can, but not all of them. But actually, you can modify all of them. Mm -hmm. And so even with genes, you can't usually change your genes overtly, but there's a whole field of study called epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And so what's cool about that field is what it it studies is how are genes expressed? Mm -hmm. And what they found is depending on what we eat, depending on our stress level, uh, depending on our exercise levels, even what the way we're thinking about things, that influences the expression of genes. So we can basically, by the day-to-day choices and behaviors we, we make, we can influence which genes are turned on and turned off Mm. and keep the good ones on and turn the bad ones off. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some genes are more stronger than others, but we really have an influence. So that's one, one big thing we can do. Developmental. We can't go back and rewrite history, right? But we can change how we relate to history. Mm -hmm. And that's why good therapy can be tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. And there's other ways. I mean, a lot of people can kind of do it on their own too, but um, it's important that if we went through trauma and difficulty in childhood, that we work through that, that we address that. And then uh, the other ones, I won't say they're completely self-explanatory, but mm-hmm. you know, I think for the most part, it's not rocket science. It's like, mm-hmm. okay. And, and there's a lot of details again that we can get into. And I know we have other episodes on some of these topics, mm-hmm. so we're not yeah. going to take the time to do that. But with stress, well, we need to learn to manage our stress, right? Mm-hmm. With with addiction, we need to identify, admit our addictions and address those. Mm-hmm. Uh, with um, toxins, what you can do, you need to be very careful about the air you breathe, the food you eat, the water you drink. Now, we don't need to eat everything organic, but there's certain foods that are actually going to be more more important to eat organic. And, and by that, I mean, uh, actually, there, there's a group that um, publishes every year what they call the Dirty Dozen. Mm. And so those are the foods that are going to have more of those toxin levels, more of the pesticides. And, and a simple example is grapes. Mm. So the reason you want to get organic grapes is because you eat the whole grape. Plus, mm. there's a lot of surface area there. Mm-hmm. So you, it's important to eat organic grapes because otherwise you're going to expose yourself to a lot of the pesticides and herbicides. On the other hand, when it comes to oranges or grapefruits, not so important, right? Because you, most people don't eat the peel. I don't know if you do. <laughs> <laughs> Tried it, but it's not, not a regular so good, thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so you peel it. There's that skin that's protecting the fruit. So generally speaking, should be okay. So you can kind of balance those things, but um, just, you know, make kind of informed decisions about what you eat. 
And then with nutrition, again, it, it really, the most important thing is try to eat whole foods. So non-processed foods, that's the most important critical factor. And second to that is trying to eat as much plant-based nutrition as possible. So trying to minimize any meat or dairy in the diet actually is optimal for mental health. And I know there's a lot of controversy about that, but I am convinced on that point after looking at a lot of the research, when you look at the preponderance of evidence, that's what we come up with again and again. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, lifestyle, so that's pretty simple, right? Um, maybe not so simple to do, but the concept, <laughs> exercise regularly, drink plenty of water, stay well hydrated, get outdoors, breathe fresh air, get sunlight, et cetera. And then as far as the circadian rhythm, again, we want to make sure that we are actually Allow, getting early to bed, early to rise is ideal, having regular times for meals and trying to have that regularity, ideally even on the weekends, like sure, maybe you can sleep in an extra hour, but really try to be careful not to sleep in several hours and that sort of thing. You want to keep it pretty regular throughout the week. And if you're having insomnia, you want to work on addressing that. And then as far as medical problems, you want to do everything you can and to address those issues. And a lot of the chronic medical problems are actually related to lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So if we do some of these other things, then a lot of times the chronic medical conditions like diabetes, even chronic pain, um, et cetera, can improve and sometimes even go completely away. And then finally, with the frontal lobe, so we want to identify, yeah, do I have unforgiveness? You know, Do I have um, guilt, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate guilt? Uh, do I have an addiction to media, whether it's social media, entertainment media, et cetera? Um, do I have any other behavioral addictions? You know, maybe it's pornography or maybe it's uh, shopping or whatever it might be. I want to address those things. And, you know, I think that's one of the most important things there is to really connect with God and, and realize that, you know, some of these things are difficult to do, whether mm -hmm. it's frontal lobe or the others, mm -hmm. but God will help us to be aware of what needs to change. And he'll also give us the strength to change mm -hmm. those things. And if we feel like, man, I just can't do it on my own. That's okay too. God can bring people into mm -hmm. our lives to come alongside us and to help us. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's really the idea behind the Mental Health Awareness Month is coming together to fight the stigma. It's coming together to support each other. And I know a lot of people are probably viewing this or listening to this, thinking from the perspective of, do I have a mental illness or, you know, what are my hits? But I also want to encourage people to listen in and start thinking about maybe the person I know that has a mental illness. Maybe I've just chalked it up to, oh, their own, their personal choices, but maybe they have a genetic component, right? It helps us have more understanding and compassion to recognize that mental illness is complex, right? Absolutely. No, I think that's a great point. And that's what it's all about is not just focusing on how can I get better, but also supporting one another. And that's really how we're going to start getting rid of the stigma and moving towards a holistic solution to mental health. Any last comments or takeaways for our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I just want to encourage our listeners and viewers to think about this. And like Katie said, you know, not just for us, but others, but don't give up, you know, don't get discouraged because it can be hard to change, but change is possible. And when you do it, you'll never regret the hard work you put in. You'll actually look back and you'll say, wow, it was hard and I had to sweat through it. And there were days I just hated the process, mm -hmm. but it was well worth it. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah, they say success is small steps added up over time. So just start taking small steps today. Thanks for listening. To hear more episodes, find us on social media or support us financially, visit thebrainpeoplepodcast.com. 